Today, we are here with Stephen Peel and Dennis Gillen, who are the co-authors of the newly released children's book, Nice Shoes. Dennis, will you do the honors of sharing what this book is about? Sure. It's about the other guy on this podcast, Stephen Peel, and he shared this story. Mm. Yeah. When I spoke at the University of Delaware, this is going back. Uh, it was April 15th, 2018. And I remember that day because the day before it was like 72 degrees and the day of the event, it was like 44 degrees. I remember that. Yeah. I remember instead of buying a t-shirt, I bought a wool hat from with a fighting blue hen on it, University of Delaware. Yeah. And during that talk, I brought up three students, Stephen being uh, one of them, one of them. And Stephen told this story on stage. And I just remember sitting off stage and going, man, I got to follow that act. It was a tough act to follow. I came back on, we wrapped it up. It was a wonderful event, raised money for Friends for Friends, over $60,000 know, for the CAPS Department at University of Delaware in, in honor of Connor Mullen, God rest his soul. So Stephen tells a story, we all leave. It's another gig for me um, and I go home and I can't forget about the story. I can't, I can't do it. So literally three, four years later, I, reach out to Stephen. I said, I can't shake that story. We got to do something with it. And I can't tell it because it's not my story. I just heard it. So uh, we're very fortunate. We had a foundation. I said, let's do a children's book. The foundation, the Half a Sorrow Foundation paid to have it published. And Stephen got to tell his story to a larger audience. Yeah, he loves telling the story about how we met. He, uh, he, always, he always brings up how I just kind of winged it. Um, that's his favorite part uh, of my speech. Everyone else had some stuff written down and I just kind of went with the flow, um, but it worked out pretty well, I guess. Absolutely. Well, Stephen, are you willing to share a little bit of that story for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I guess uh, background on me is I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in senior year of high school. Um, so around 18 uh, years old. And uh, so before that, I was just, you know, I was undiagnosed, so I was struggling. Um, I was struggling finding friend groups. I was struggling just kind of with my own uh, emotional control. And um, one day was an, uh, an extra bad day, and I just didn't want to be here anymore, uh, to kind of put it bluntly. Um, I kind of had this plan in my head that I was uh, going to check out. I guess, for lack of a better term, um, after school, I had um, my parents didn't come home for a couple hours after school. So I was like, OK, today's the day. Um, so I was in a really dark place. But uh, someone came up to me, um, I think it was like towards the end of the day um, and I had just gotten new shoes and uh, they came up to me and, you know, we didn't really have a rapport or anything. It wasn't like a really good friend. It was just someone who came up to me and was like, hey, I like your shoes. Um, and I went home happy that day. I uh, went home with a smile on my face and obviously I'm still here. Um, so it, it was just the, the small act of kindness of just saying a little compliment that turned my horrible day, horrible week, horrible month um, into a good day. Um, and so I think we just really wanted to encapsulate that in a children's book, um, make it easy to digest um, and kind of address the the concept of what's called uh, learned helplessness um, of every day is going to be like this. I had a bad day yesterday and the day before that. So that means tomorrow is going to be bad too. Um, and also how you can kind of combat that just by being a nice friend, being a good person um, and just saying something like, hey, I like your shirt. You got a nice smile, like your glasses, anything like that. Um, a little compliment can go a long way. So and it for sure did for me. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that that story. Yeah. It's, it's very vulnerable of you, and, and we appreciate that openness. And sure. what did you think that a compliment like that would be able to have the impact that it had? Like, would no you have shot. ever predicted that? You know, when you had decided to go home and and you know you were you had given up. You know, mm -hmm. did you ever think that someone could say something so small and it would turn everything no. around? No, because I think I think it's a it's a combination of um, like the the abstractness of mental health issues. Um, so it's not like you can you can really see it and oh, I can help you with a broken leg. I can help you with like 
physical pain, but it's hard to realize how much you can help someone or how to help someone in general who's struggling with their mental health. Um, and so at the time, I didn't even think that um, a little compliment like that could could help me. I thought, you know, because I was always uh, told that whether it's therapy or whether it's medications, um, anything like that, you kind of you have to go more into like a medical route and like with a professional. And, and that's kind of like that was in my head, the only really way to go and combat things. Um, but like having that personal experience, it just it's so hard to describe because it's just like it kind of breaks that it breaks that little cycle. You know what I mean? It's because your your brain is so focused on the negatives, on what's uh, what's happening that's bad, um, what's going to happen that's bad, what has happened that's bad. But when you have that little compliment, um, it just registered in, with me in a way that was just disrupted that cycle of negative thoughts. Um, you know, and I guess I didn't feel helpless that day um, because of that small little compliment. I felt confident um because like i mean the shoes were on my mind I, I just recently got them so like they're something that i knew about right and then someone right. else noticing it without me being like hey check out the check out the new kicks like with someone like uh, on their own who i didn't even have a like a, a in-depth relationship with um saying something that like that was was just eye-opening um in 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 the moment it was it saved my life, honestly. Um, it was just, it was something that was so out of the blue, um, but so authentic at the same time that it just, it just put a smile on my face. I can't I keep going back to that. Like I, I, I went from not wanting to be on the earth to going home with a smile on my face because of one little small compliment. And I just, and so that's, that's why we were just like, yeah, we got to, Especially, especially Dennis was like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta do something about this, this story. So um, I'm glad, I'm glad we definitely reconnected. Do you think it made a difference that it was someone young, someone your age range that made the compliment opposed to sure. an adult maybe? For sure. That's a really good point, actually. Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's like your parents can give you advice, but if your friend gives you the same exact advice word for word, you're probably gonna be like, oh, I, I did it because my friend told me to, right? So it's the, it's, you know, there, there is that generational gap um, between like teachers, parents and stuff. Um, so when it's coming from a peer, someone who you identify with, someone who you relate to um, on a deeper level, it, yeah, it, it really, it really hits harder and it really, it makes more of an impact um and you know i wish i knew why we you know i wish i wish that it was fine for every single parent to be like yeah i you know nice shoes and everyone's good to go but it's it's really people in in your age cohort and people who are around you who are who are your age and like you um that really i think is is a, is a much different uh experience because you know you don't you don't really get too many compliments just randomly out of the blue, um, especially from like kids in high school. Uh, and it's that validation. I think validation sure. from from kids your age, because with adults, it's like they're always, they're always giving kids compliments. They're trying to make right. them feel right. better. And yeah, them so up. That, that's what I was trying to articulate. It's like it becomes moot at a certain point. It just comes like, you know, it doesn't have that much of an impact. But when it's someone who's who's your age, it's it, it hits a lot different and it and it feels a lot better. Exactly. No, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Dennis, so where did the idea for a children's book come from? Why a children's book instead of just having Stephen share his story um, on YouTube or on a podcast like this? What was the, the idea behind doing a children's book? Well, it's very selfish. One, I always wanted to be an author. And two, I hate writing. So we thought a children's book would be, no, I'm kidding. It's nice and short. No, that's the audience. Here's the, there's a logical reason for this. That's the audience we need. If we're going to start talking about mental health for when I did my talk and for the listeners out there, I lost two brothers to suicide and for years didn't talk about it. That's how I got in this business. So I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist. And when I was doing my talk at colleges, then I got asked to do it at high schools. All right. And then I got asked to do middle schools. And to tell you the truth, that's where we need to start uh, early and talking about mental health, younger. So the children's book made perfect sense. Here's a kid having a bad day, uh, ruminating on it. 
and, and a kind, well-placed compliment changes everything. So there's so many messages there. And I just thought that would be the perfect audience to start this early. Let these kids know that, yes, you will have bad days. Sorry, you have to hear it from us, but, but it happens. And then two, a one little simple act of kindness can go a long way. And, and Stephen's living proof of that. So it just, just made sense. Yeah, we're, we're not really taught things in, in, in uh, middle school and elementary school. Like you're not taught empathy. You're not taught um to be cognizant of people's emotions and things like that so like like dennis said start young and then it just becomes a habit right yeah a lot of people say kindness is taught so that's sure. an ongoing debate but i definitely think it is we have to lead by example and what would you say what would either of you say either of you could take this question to people who would maybe say, this is too early of a conversation to have with kids. We're talking about mental health. We're, you know, maybe alluding to suicide. Um, this is, you know, too young of an age to start these conversations. What would you say to, to combat that? Um, I think we, I think it, it, the way we deliver it um, definitely helps with its, with how it can be digested. Um, I think just making it very simple concepts. You don't have to get into the minutia of what depression is. You don't have to get, you don't have to like physically talk about learned helplessness. Um, but we just hint at those things because they're very common. So we'll just go through it. Do kids have brains? Yes. Do kids have emotions? Yes. Do kids have bad days? Yes. Well, then they're qualified to talk about their mental health. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it can be too young. I think it can be too in depth too early. Um, but if you just have these basic concepts, um, like, like in the book, we talk about um, how Derek's just having a bad day and he thinks all days are going to be like this. That is technically breaching and broaching the subject of uh, learned helplessness. But we don't outright say it. We're not a psychology book. Um, so we're just trying to relate to the human emotion, um, I guess. And and how we all have bad days. We've all felt like these bad days are going to keep continuing on and on and on because I've had a couple in a row, right? So it's just how the brain works. Um, so I think the way we, we simplify it um, makes it easily digestible and, and easy to talk about, but also it's just necessary. Um, you know, it, it, there's, no, there's no age lower age limit on being sad. There's no lower age limit on on having a bad day. There's no lower age limit on, on these kind of darker thoughts. Um, and so I think it just, as much as it's uncomfortable to talk about sometimes, it, it's, it's like working out, you know, the first couple of weeks, it hurts and I don't want to go back. But after, you know, that the, the, the soreness goes away and I get used to it, get into the, the rhythm of it. I love, I love working out. So it's the same thing about talking about your emotions at first. I don't really want to do it. But then the more you do it, the more it feels right. And the more it, it feels like it's actually benefiting you and it's not a chore. Yeah, absolutely. And I know from experience, mental health can be onset from genetics or it can be a result of um, a traumatic incident or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and I know personally, so I live with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I've had symptoms um, of OCD since as long as I can remember, probably four or five years old. And the amount of anxiety that that caused for me because I didn't understand it. And I had these intrusive thoughts at such a young age and they were scary to me. And because it wasn't an open conversation in school or at home, I felt like if I had shared my thoughts with other people, um, or shared the fear that I was experiencing as a result of these thoughts, they would think that I was crazy or they wouldn't believe me or it would mean that something was seriously wrong with me. And so, you know, I think since we can, we can experience these symptoms of mental illness so early, it's important for us to be able to talk about them and to digest them, whether it's in depth or not. Um, a question I have maybe you can answer this, Dennis. Do you think this is a good children's book to be read in classrooms? Or do you think this is something that should be kept more to um, parents and guardians and, and their children? Oh, he loves, he's gonna love this question. I, yeah, I wrote it. 
we wrote it <laughs> for, for use anywhere. It's a great conversation start at home. Uh, to tell you the truth, I had educators in the back of my mind the whole time. They can go anywhere they want with this book. Yep. Uh, there's a bullying aspect in there, rumination, you name it, it's in there. Uh, and we end on kindness and a real good message of hope. It's wide open. This, you know, we, we should develop a curriculum based on this. And Steve and I will have some work to do for a backup for like education. Where you want to go on this page, where you want to, it's at a surface level and you go as deep as you want with this book but i think you know at, around the kitchen table at bedtime uh in a classroom i look forward to the day where Stephen and i are sitting in front of a bunch of kids and we get to read it i'm really looking forward to that day when this thing gets fully It'll blown out day. released it'd be a great day and i get to sit there and talk to these kids and the whole time you know I, I mentioned earlier that i lost two brothers to suicide that word never comes up in the book you know mm-hmm. it's a that's a tough word and you, we're looking at young kids you know maybe we can't put the idea the head we the research is there but we just don't want to broach that subject but you can go a million different ways with this book and i think it's written uh you know based on a true story which was given to us by steve and thank you and then it's it's anywhere you want to go you can go and there's so many aspects that poor derek is going through that the educator the mom the dad anybody the parent can take with this so it's i'm going to say it can be used anywhere steven what do you think I, I mean, I agree. I think it's it's a great way to, again, kind of broach the subject of not feeling good, feeling upset, whatever whatever that entails, um, is like specific to the inv- individual. But um, especially with kids who are in school, we talk about um, failing a test. Um, we talk about forgetting homework, like stuff that I've done many times. And, uh, and so I think, I think it's the fact that it is relatable, but the fact that it, it's also, um, it's also light, um, cause it ends on a positive note and things are sure things are hinted at, um, but that opens up avenues for discussion that opens up questions that opens up, um, oh yeah, I've, I've felt like that. And then they can talk more about, um, what it's like to feel that way and how they got out of it or how they get through it, um, what, what turn their day around, things like that. So it's just a, it's a great way to kind of start having that conversation. Cause with my parents, we, I mean, I talk to them about everything. We have very in-depth conversations, um, especially when I was, um, in college, you know, stressful as can be. And so, uh, talking to them about my mental state, um, just got easier, uh, over time. And if I had a book like that, it would have been even easier. Um, because we would have started talking a long time ago about these kind of things. And so I think it's, it just becomes part of the conversation of just like, so the, the character who Derek is based off of is, is my best friend, um, Derek, and his dad will always be like, Hey, how, how you doing? How you feeling? He gets very annoyed by it uh, here and there, but that's like, that's a common question that his dad will ask him all the time. It's just like, how are you feeling? You're feeling okay. Um, and stuff like that. It's not just like, how was your day? So like even those simple questions of how how you feeling, like it doesn't need to have a long winded answer to it, but just that question in and of itself is like, oh, you care. Um, so right, I, asking I think, those I, those yeah, typical yeah. questions, but with intention. Right, it helps. So it, it can help the parents as well um, of like figuring out how to how to talk about these kind of things. Yeah, what I love about it is that I think I remember all of my my favorite childhood books. And I think when you're little, especially when you're a baby, that's one of the first things that your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles do with you is they read storybooks. And that's, those are the stories that you memorize. Those are the characters that you get to know because you read them over and over and over again. And you have your favorites and you relate to those certain characters. And I remember when I was little, I remember I would read Junie B. Jones. And when I was little, I I have ADHD and I was a very hyperactive child and I got in trouble a lot at school for being too talkative or for doing silly things and um, the the teachers didn't really understand me that well and I remember always reading Junie B. Jones and being like oh this is what this is what I'm like like it's okay to be outgoing and crazy and and it's okay to sometimes get 
scolded or to forget your homework and you have that like horrible pit in your stomach of like oh no everybody in the class is going to know I forgot my homework and they're going to think I'm a loser and I didn't do it and I'm not smart and I remember reading Ginny B. Jones and seeing that she would make silly little mistakes too and that giving me so much um, reassurance and it was like a safe haven to kind of go into those books and and to fall into them like that so I just I think it's amazing that you've created this character that so many children are going to be able to relate to off the bat, or they're going to keep that character in mind when they're in class and they have a bad day um, or someone bullies them or, you know, they forget their homework or whatever it might be. Um, You guys have created such a powerful safe haven for, for little kids. And so I, I really commend you guys for that. And um, I just, I love that you guys have done this and I, I appreciate you guys coming on. How can uh, our listeners support you guys? Where can they find the book? Um, are you guys going to continue to have conversations like this? What, what can our listeners do to kind of get on board here? Well, so Dennis has, um, we have a date planned for August 1st, August 1st for like a, a hardcore launch. Um, Dennis can talk about that more. Uh, but it is it is out. It's on Amazon. Um, so if you want to search up "Nice Shoes" um, by Dennis Galen and Stephen Peel, it should pop up. Um, if you don't remember how to spell our names, you can just do "Nice Shoes." A little compliment can go a long way, and it should pop up. Um, there's a hardcover, and um, there's Kindle edition, um, paperback. So um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Amazing. This is my first real first real foray into publishing so we're excited we're putting together a marketing plan but you know everyone buys you know the amazon truck is on everyone's street every day it's it's so easy to get it you should probably be there tomorrow if you wanted it but that's where we're going with this and then hopefully to get into the local bookstores and do some readings for the kids that's what some of the goals are on the marketing plan and i often worried about i'm just going to elaborate here i often worried about sometimes people say oh it's about the shoes it's about the shoes no it's about being seen you know, it's about being seen. This kid finally, all day long, he seems like he's in the background. And finally on the way out the door, he's he's seen for, you know, as a human. And that that just makes, that, that's why I couldn't shake the story. It was just, I heard it in 2018, thought about it until 2020, 2021, when I got hold of Steve yeah, in 2022. You call me like reality. once a year or something like that and be like, you want to do something <laughs> with this. And I was like, I don't know if he's actually being serious. And then... We're serious, uh, serious about it. Called me and we're like, yeah, let's do this. Well, we got lucky. And I'd say lucky, you know, luck favors, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. We, I have a foundation now to call the Half a Sorrow Foundation, which is based on the Swedish proverb, a shared joy is a double joy. A shared sorrow is half a sorrow. And the good people that donated to that foundation made this book possible because then we can go to the publisher and say, we're doing this. Mm-hmm. And they actually helped pay for it. So thank you for all the supporters. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank mm-hmm. you so much for the support. Because I mean, I'm I'm a neuroscience guy. I never thought I'd be writing a book. Um, so it's it's really it's really cool to see it come to fruition. Um, and this this very odd pairing of Dennis and myself. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's just I don't know. It just it couldn't have been better timing. It couldn't have um, been with a better person um and dennis and and his foundation and everything like that so it's just yeah only up from here um amazing amazing well if someone has the bookstore or a classroom and they want you guys to come in and do a reading how can they get into contact with you so you can reach me um at spihl13 at gmail.com um or you can um hit up dennis dennis you can give your email (laughs) I'll just go to the uh, Dennis at half a sorrow.org. Dennis at half a sorrow.org. Go to the website. I have a TEDx talk on there, seen by dozens. It's my mom's favorite TEDx talk. Uh, <laughs> we're, do- we're doing a lot in the space, but the-, the book is like right now the keystone to what all we do. And it's it's trying to spread kindness and, and, and turn someone's day around like Derek's and Stevens. Can I get back to the story real quick about Delaware, University of Delaware? Stephen alluded yeah, to the story. <laughs> oh, this is in the beginning, he alluded to the story like, when I bring, when I speak publicly and we decide to bring people on stage, and I've done this a couple of times, like if I'm at University of Delaware 
and I'm going to bring up Delaware students. What I do prior to that is I vet them. One, we use the good folks at Friends for Friends, and they said, here's three people. And then I get them on the phone, and we talk about safe messaging, which is, you know, I just did a whole thing on reporting on safe suicide, you know, reporting on a suicide for journalists. Certain words we use, you, you yeah. everyone here has used the word commit and all this stuff. So we just have to go through all this stuff. So I'm vetting that the, the, the two young ladies were awesome. They wrote it out, you know, and everything else, and it was fine. And one, we had to tweak a little bit. And then I get Steven on the phone. And he goes, I'm just going to wing it. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> bro, we don't wing anything. And, you know, there's people we're speaking to may be vulnerable in the audience. We're vulnerable on stage. They're mm -hmm. going to be vulnerable in the audience. Say, so, yeah, I'm going to just wing it. I remember, I remember that, like, I hung up the phone, like, son of a gun. This guy's giving me fits already. And, um, so we, we, we kind of honed the message, but he still didn't really write it down. He had it in his head. He brings his posse up there and he's got a bunch of guys rooting for him. And it's, he goes on dead last right there. And that's when I was off the, you know, he tells a story and then Steven, you ended it with like oh. a, almost a, a drop the mic moment. Yeah. So, um, again, I, I, it's just about my journey, um, in high school, um, and this story specifically, um, and getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder and everything like that. Um, so I end it with, um, one last thing, I'm not bipolar, I'm Steven, um, just to kind of separate the, the disorder from who I am as a person. Um, yeah. So the, important. The crowd goes nuts, the crowd goes <laughs> nuts, and then I have to come back out. I'm like, <laughs> crap, crap, crap. You know, you, it's like a warm-up band. They should, they should stink a little bit so they make me look good. Um, I always say, when I bring students up on stage, I, it happened at Delaware. I said, you never bring up someone better than you. I did it three times, and Stephen comes on dead last, kills it, dropped the mic. I'm like, all right, you're done. Go go for a walk, everybody. Just do your walk thing. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. I had this big finish. You know, it's not that big anymore. Stephen just killed it, and um, have a good day. Well, I'll There's always no remember both of your speeches. They were amazing and, and very touching to me, and, um, you know, I, I myself have lost a friend to suicide. And so I've been touched by um, mental illness, not only personally, but by those around me. And so I just always appreciate anybody who's willing to stand up and be vulnerable and share their story. Um, Cause it's always made me feel more comfortable to be open about my experiences. So thank you guys so much again for everything that you're doing. You're doing amazing work. I am honored to be able to have you guys on our podcast today and yeah. good luck thank with so the much. rest of your journey. Yeah, appreciate it for having us. Um, again, uh, the book will be dropping officially, probably I think uh, August first. So uh, you know, check out. We'll send you some like links and everything like that, so you can uh, send it out and stuff. So uh, should be a good time. Yeah, and we need your address, Juliet. We got to get you a signed autograph. Copy. How about <laughs> oh, that? please! Gotta yes, get you my John that. Hancock. I've been practicing. I've been practicing. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much to our listeners. This is Brains Out Loud, and we'll see you next time.